Welcome everybody to our panel called African Digital Renaissance, how African researchers are creating data and models for NLP. My name is Paul Kennedy. I work at Zindi as a community and communication manager. Um, so before we meet our panelists, um, Zindi is a competition platform focusing on data science in Africa. We host machine learning challenges um, and we work in all sorts of different fields of machine learning and AI, but right now we want to focus on NLP. We've been uh, working closely with AI4D for the last year or so, maybe a bit more, uh, to host um, NLP challenges, helping to collect data sets and so on. Um, so I'm joined today by Dr. Joyce Nakatumba Nabende from Makerere University AI Research Lab in Uganda. Uh, Tiana Ibrahima from Bamtu Datamation in Senegal and Jade Abbott from Masakane NLP and you're based in South Africa. Um, so thank you to the three of you for joining us today. Um, could you please just take a minute to introduce yourselves and tell us why and how you got into NLP research and practice. Uh, Tiana, I'll start with you, please. Okay, uh, thank you. Paul. So my name as you just say it is general job and I work as a lead data scientist at Bamtu, which is a company in Senegal. Yeah. We work with, with uh, in data science, big data and also software engineering, but I am mostly in the data science part and especially in the NLP stuff. So I work with uh, text to, in text to speech, speech recognition, uh, text translate, translation also and uh, I also do other stuff, but I mainly work on that, and I mostly also apply those techniques in Wolof language, uh, also in other language, but mostly in Wolof. So we work on collecting data uh, in Wolof, and soon also in other local languages. But for now, we are mostly working on Wolof, so building data sets, building models, evaluating them, and so on. Great, thank you so much, uh, Joyce. Over to you. Thank you, Paul. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Joyce Nakatumba Nabende, as introduced. I'm a lecturer first in the Department of Computer Science at Makere University and also carry out research at the Makere Artificial Intelligence Lab. Uh, so much of the work that we are doing in the lab is to use uh, computer science uh, techniques, especially machine learning, uh, computer vision and natural language processing to solve uh, problems in health and in agriculture. And uh, part of the work that we've begun to do is in natural language processing, where we are trying to, first of all, build the resources uh, for natural language processing, especially for low resource languages in Uganda. Our particular focus has been on Uganda, uh, but we also focus on other local languages in Uganda, which is Runyankole, uh, Luma, Sava, Acholi as well. So uh, that's how I get introduced into NLP, because we are interested in building uh, speech recognition models. Uh, for our local languages, especially to analyze uh, sentiments and issues that people are talking about uh, on radio. And much of that is uh, dependent on natural language processing. And that's how the lab comes in. And that's how we get to do uh, much of the NLP work that we're going to discuss today. Thank you. Thanks so much, Joyce. And over to you, Jade. Cool. So I got into uh, natural language processing, I think, when I was a child and I wanted to build my own robot friend and I realized I needed to have a conversation. Um, the other part would be that I'm really terrible at learning languages. So I could speak English, but I couldn't speak. I could, I've struggled so much to learn other languages and I found it was a huge barrier to me growing up in such a diverse country in such a diverse continent, not being able to learn languages. Um, so at some stage at the Deep Learning in Daba, um, I met a couple of people and they were all keen on working in NLP and machine translation for African languages um, and I kind of, over the next year, um, we came up with this idea of um, Masakane. Um, well, we didn't come up with the idea that it means uh, we build together in Isizulu. And the goal there is like, cool, if we actually want to solve this problem, we need to have very wide participation from the continent. We need everyone involved. We need people from multiple different languages, from many different countries uh, to help build resources, um, to help train models, to help evaluate them. Um, and yeah, that's my, my brief introduction into it. 
Cool. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to all of you. So um, I'd like to move on now to asking you each to talk about a major project that you are involved with in African um, natural language processing, something that you're working on right now. Um, so we can start with you, Joyce. Thank you, Paul. Um, so one major project that we are looking at as the lab uh, is a project around building a full speech cognition model for Luganda. And why, how that came to be is uh, we, we got a grant where we were supposed to uh, map image data with radio data to help smallholder farmers in disease surveillance. Uh, so our image, the image part of the project was fully developed because we've uh, been doing work around uh, building computer vision models uh, on mobile phones for several diseases, uh, including cassava. And as part of that project, we also grew to beans uh, and maize. Uh, however, when we talked about the, the trying to map this with the radio work where uh, we were trying to understand uh, how do people speak on radio? What are they talking about? How can we do this, the disease surveillance uh, merely through radio? Because if, if, if there's a problem that happens in community, what people will do is that they'll go to the radio and call in because they, they expect that probably someone from the agriculture sector is listening to them or someone from government is listening to them. And, and so they can report and say, oh, we have a locust outbreak that has been a problem in Uganda or full armyworm outbreak in my garden. And they expect that they will get intervention. So if the information is out there in radio, the problem is that radio is very diverse. There's a lot that's going on and, and it's not easy for the agricultural experts to go in uh, and be able to uh, mine those radio recordings to understand uh, what's going on in terms of disease surveillance. So that brought in the work that inspired us to uh, build a uh, uh, fast just keyword spotter models uh, for radio recording. And as part of that, we realized that the problem we had was that there were no resources for uh, any language, any local language in Uganda in terms of speech recognition. We didn't have the data to start with. And uh, even if we started with radio, radio is uh, you know, very cluttered. People talk over each other. You know, there's music. It's very, very complicated. So we started up by saying, uh, let's start by collecting resources for the Luganda language. And that brought us to uh, partnering with Mozilla and GIZ over a period of one year now. Uh, and, and the aim was, uh, can we be able to build up this speech to text resources, which eventually can help us to build up the speech cognition models. And so part of that work was to push Luganda as a, as a, as a community or as a language, sorry, uh, on the Common Voice platform, because this is very important that we can build a community around Luganda uh, where people can be able to participate and contribute and make voice contributions uh, for Luganda on, on Common Voice platform. And we've been able to launch that towards the end of last year. And part of the work that we are going to do this year is to drive communities and to drive uh, people to be able to contribute and build uh, language resources around this. So that has been one of the things that we are doing in the lab. The other part has been uh, around training a full speech recognition model. And I'm happy to report that uh, we've been able to uh, uh, sufficiently build that. And so we are doing more training and we <laughs> expect that as we get more data <laughs> from the Common Voice platform will keep training because we want to make sure it's as diverse as possible to handle gender, to handle different age groups. So we are hoping and, and that the more data that we collect, that we can be able to use that to train uh, this full speech recognition model. And it will, we'll, we'll report about it out there as soon. Uh, yeah, that's the work that we're doing in the lab in NLP. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, Tiano, would you like to tell us a bit about what you're working on at bomb at the moment? Okay, thank you. Actually, we are working on many stuff about Wolof, but I think I will just focus on one of them. Maybe I will just talk about the uh, translation that we are doing now. Uh, so the thing is, you know, most of the most of the resources we have are in French or English, you know. We have, we have very less data in Wolof, uh, written or spoken. Uh, speak, I mean, yes, it's in the spoken, we have many spoken data set that we could have without any labels, but we have them. But in text, we have very few. So what we are doing is we are collecting data set in Wolof uh, French, and we are working with a team of so uh, an expert team in Wolof. So they are helping us to do the data collection. So we are working with them. Of course, we are paying them. And also we are 
they are also part of the project. So this make the project live along. Uh, and for now, we are in the data collection phase and also of the experimentation phase. So what we are doing in is we are doing this in a parallel way. So they give us, you know, batch of data set and we are working in parallel to do experimentation, see what work, what are the main uh, problems and challenges that we have to solve in the, that are, that are particular to Wolof. So for example, we have to do uh, some limitization in Wolof, we have to do uh, tokenization and all those stuff. They are not yet in the NLP tools that people use or we are using for other languages. So we are working and solving those problems while waiting to have more data set from them. So it's kind of a work in progress. And I think that, you know, the translation part is the last uh, subject that we attacked in BAM2. We have already worked on speech recognition and also we are working also in text speech, but the translation part is one I think that will be the biggest one and that will take the much time to build, but you know, it's exciting to work on that field because we need all those three parts to be able to have a system that people can use because unfortunately, people can't write in Wolof normally. Me, I can't, and I, I speak Wolof very well, I think, but I have to, we have to build a system where one can talk, so a speech recognition system, and we take the text, maybe do some translation if needed, because we are talking to someone else. And if you have also text in Wolof, many people also can read Wolof, I mean, Wolof writer normally. So we have also to build a text to speech that will, be able to give an audio from a text. So that's why all these parts are equally important and we are working um, in a parallel way to, you know, to build all those three stuff. Great. And I just want to follow up briefly because, uh, you know, um, uh, unlike Masakane and um, the Makarere AI Lab, uh, Bamtu is a for-profit company. Um, what is your plan to turn this into a product or products uh, in future? Uh, actually, many companies here have already talked to us and they need those kind of system, especially telecom companies. So uh, many of their users don't write or speak French and all their system are mainly in French. So they need a system to uh, speak Wolof or to understand Wolof. They need some chatbots to be able to speak or write in Wolof. So I think customers are not really the problem. The problem is just to ship the solutions into production. And we already have many propositions from many companies that need one or other part. For example, there, are, there was a, a company who is sending SMS. So their role is just to send SMS to users and they want to be able to take that SMS, translate that SMS in Wolof first, and then uh, have a text-to-speech system to pronounce those texts because people can't read the Wolof. So, you know, uh, I think the production and the demand is already here. We just have to collect data set and build the model, especially collect data set. That's the main problem. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and Jade, if you can tell us a bit about maybe one of the major projects Masakane is working on at the moment. Yeah, so we've, we've got a couple. Um, so the one the one I'm most excited about uh, is when we had a, a call on earlier. Uh, Theano was actually uh, there. It's the first time I saw the demo. So over the past, um, year and a bit, uh, Masakanya's first kind of goal was to build and train as many translation models as possible. So where um, Makarere, um, so Joyce and the others groups, they do kind of, they go into depth and try and make a, a model that's actually going to be useful. We just wanted to kind of spur research. So we try to find data sets that were as wide as possible and build as many mo models to kind of get that starting point to see where is, what is the state? What, do, what are we at and then what do we need to do next? And from that, we said, cool. So now that we've got all these baseline models, uh, the next step is to start getting feedback on them. So we're working on a Masakane web platform, which uh, initially will support the machine translation models that we've trained up. 
And the idea is you can go there, you can select uh, your language pairs that we have available, um, you can translate in them, and then you can give feedback. Um, and the main thing is it's right now not necessarily a product, it's more an experimentation and a growth and improvement platform. And ideally, we'd use any of the data we gathered there to, to help improve the models and then grow our data sets, our open data sets over time. Um, so that's what's busy happening. I currently saw some demos earlier and I'm very excited. And kind of the scope of that is um, we want to grow that into supporting some of the speech stuff that's been going on. Um, so Bantu, for instance, are looking at, you know, uh, also providing a front end where they can kind of uh, integrate with the, the whole uh, Masakane movement and want to expand that to as many languages as, as possible and as many tasks. Um, so that's kind of the, the summary. We currently have, I think, 40, 48 models, translation models, uh, either from, usually from English or French into respective African language and sometimes uh, the reverse. Um, and yeah, so that should be kind of launching uh, around about sort of the end of May, which is pretty cool. I'm very excited. <laughs> That's awesome. And and um, am I right in making the assumption that this is um, being published in, in under some kind of open source framework? I mean, yeah, you're obviously so, generating a lot of IP and value. Yeah, so everything's everything's open source, everything's open research, everything's open data. Um, and the idea is that the community can then, the, the, the African community can then build on that because I don't think anything we're going to publish is going to be productizable yet. But ideally, we want people from the movement to just go start their own businesses and you know, become the experts in their country for their language that they, that they care about. Because at the moment, yeah, everything's open. So the models that are uh, that we're deploying are already available. So if you go on to the most kind of GitHub, um, they're, they're there, they're under the MIT license. So it's very open um, use uh, that anyone can uh, download, play with, um, get stuck in the code. So um, yeah, the, the most kind of web, website as well will, will also be open source. So anyone can even fork it and adapt it for their own use case. Brilliant. And uh, when can we expect to see the platform live? Uh, end of May is the, the date cool. that, that, that I was being told earlier. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure, I think end of May we will definitely uh, get there. Cool. Okay, brilliant. Um, okay, so I want to move on, just keeping an eye on the time. So in our conversations previously, and, and we've touched on them now in this panel, there seems to be sort of four major organizations working in the space at the moment, uh, that being Masakane, Mozilla, um, AI4D Africa, and the Lacuna Fund, which we haven't touched on much. Um, I'd like to ask each of you to talk a bit about those organizations and um, what's being done there. Um, uh, I'm try trying to think about how best to do this. I think, uh, Joyce, you mentioned talking, you mentioned working with Mozilla. Would you be happy to tell us about that? And I think you're also working with uh, Lacuna Fund a little bit. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Um, so I'll start uh, with Mozilla. So uh, Mozilla is so the platform that they have, um, Mozilla is a company, but the platform that they have uh, is the Common Voice platform. Uh, and with this Common Voice platform, it's just an open platform uh, that allows uh, anyone to you know, come up and add their language. Uh, of course, there are steps that, that have to be taken, like localizing the entire platform to your local language, uh, because they try to make sure that it speaks to you as much as possible. So you will not find like the platform in English for a language like Luganda, which is in Uganda. So we go through the process of trying to localize the entire platform such that when you get there, it's seen your language. And then once you do that, then you're able to uh, push as much text uh, corpus as possible uh, that eventually people can come in and read. And, and so it's, it's that open. So the text corpus that you push there has to be in a, in a common license, in an open license, uh, that it's, it's, it's very easy uh, for someone to come in and build a model uh, out of this data that you're providing. And so what it does is to try and provide a platform where uh, you can easily be able to uh, take care of certain issues that you care about in your language you know, things around uh, building a free and an unbiased data set, you know, around uh, the, the, the gender that it can encourage uh, females and males to register or anybody else, or even the age groups as well. Those are taken into consideration because it's free, it's open, and, and, and you can also have a way that people can be able to register and put in that demographic data such that at the end of the day, when you have your speech to text uh, corpus, that you can, you know, know the composition of this, uh, of this corpus in terms of the number of contributors, but also uh, all those other the factors that you care about and so that's the common voice platform it's actually now open for any african language the process 
this is a bit lengthy, but we, we, they are trying to, you know, make it easier that uh, any other language can be there. So in, 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 in terms of the African languages, we have Kinyaranda, that was the first one to launch there. Then we have Luganda, and efforts are also underway to have Kiswahili uh, launched uh, on the Common Voice platform as well. Sorry, we all know the value that Kiswahili has because it's, it's the most widely spoken language uh, on, on the African continent. So that's uh, also being added uh, on the Common Voice uh, platform. And, and this is also being supported alongside uh, with GIZ that's partnering with Mozilla to move into the African uh, space. Uh, then speaking about Lacuna, so I was uh, on the advisory board or, or the selection board for NLP for, for Lacuna. And so Lacuna is, is a fund that's constituted again by Google, by IDRSC, and uh, I don't know if I remember that, that company that's sponsoring all this. Uh, anyway, so what they're trying to do is that they're trying to provide funding for building uh, data sets, uh, open data sets. So the first call was for agricultural data sets. The second call uh, was for NLP data sets. And the third one is going to be for health. And so for NLP, I know that the, the awards are going to be announced uh, quite soon, uh, where they are encouraging as many African researchers as possible and providing them with funding and the support uh, to be able to build these language resources, both speech and text for different uh, African languages. And I think this will also go a long way in trying to uh, tackle the problem of, of having availability of resources that we require to build our NLP models on. So I think through this funding, this problem will uh, eventually, uh, yeah, it's a very good step in the right direction towards uh, building African NLP on the continent. Brilliant, thanks. Um, Jade, I know you've spoken a fair bit about Masakane already, but I thought maybe you could touch on um, how Masakane uh, supports itself and and how it, you know, maybe a bit about the model of, of how you go about being a, a sustainable um, organization. Um, through chaos, I think. <laughs> <laughs> through lots of enthusiasm and chaos. Um, uh, so we're completely, completely volunteer based, uh, completely, and at this point we are looking towards getting funding for certain aspects of it. Um, and the and completely open. So the goal with Masakanya is to kind of lower the barriers for kind of entry into NLP, but also into African NLP. Um, we also like to challenge the way research is done. So typically, if you look at international NLP research, it's first of all, very English focused. Second of all, uh, it's very kind of westernized in the way that it does science. So there'll be like two or three authors and we're like, you know, even, even on the multilingual papers where they've got 2000 languages that they're, they're trying to publish for, uh, we, we, we include everyone who's got language expertise as, as a researcher. And that is the truth, right? That we couldn't be doing the research if we did not have every person from the data contributors to the curators, to, to the evaluators, to the model builders. Um, and as a result, we like to publish papers with like 50 plus authors, <laughs> just to, <laughs> just to, I don't know, make a scene and put up, show, show a different way of doing research. That research can be participatory. We don't have to have this exploitative model where you've got people sitting in the West trying to build stuff with Africa, like Africans, we will just build it together essentially. Um, and uh, what, it, what it results in is quite a, like a, a a welcoming casual um, community where we have a lot of kind of these kind of bite-sized opportunities for mentorship. Um, so either people are teaching each other about their languages or they're teaching each other about NLP or we're just kind of diving into help. Um, we have weekly meetings. So every week on a Thursday, uh, it's open. So if you join the Masakana Slack, you'll get invited to the meeting and you can join and share whatever you're working on or just listen. Um, we kind of run these larger initiatives, which are spearheaded by different people. So uh, it might be in a particular task. So that maybe people want to push on named entity recognition, which is uh, one of the big ones we've got going at the moment. Um, maybe everyone wants to apply to uh, like a grant uh, or like do a grant application. So there was a number of uh, applications from Masakane for the Lacuna Fund, for example. Or maybe someone just wants to apply for their, their PhD and they'd like some guidance um, and they'd like someone to read their, their letters or something like that. So it's very wide, unstructured, um, anarchistic in a way, uh, and, and, and that's sort of what, what feels it is the passion for like making that change and kind of the, the, the communal spirit um, of Masakane. So, yeah. Cool to see you uh, speaking about it with such passion. It sounds like fun. Always. <laughs> it's so fun. <laughs> Everyone should come. <laughs> I say that, but I think Fiona and, and Joyce are involved uh, at, at least 
<laughs> tangentially and all their teams are involved. <laughs> Um, and you know, um, I know that BAM2 have been one of the recipients of the AI4D's um, NLP grant. Could you tell us a little bit about how that process went and the kind of support that you're getting from AI4D? Okay, thank you. So, yes, uh, I think we start working on World of since two years, and uh, since I think one year or something like that, uh, Zindi have has created a competition, yes, uh, about giving data set uh, in NLP. And we provided our already collected data set in speech recognition in the urban transport domain. Uh, and we said, OK, let's just do it. Since we have already collected this data and it could be meaningful maybe to do some uh, test about speech recognition on, uh, on an African language. So we, we did upload the data set. And yes, we have won that month, I think. Yes, and Air4D, I think, was the organizer behind that with Zindi. And yes, we received the funds. And after that, Air4D invited us to participate on another uh, data collection. Uh, yes, on another data collection. And we tried to do a data collection that will do be you know helpful for everyone because if your condition take a lot of time and a lot of money and you know a lot of resources to be to build data set about it uh, so we go for text to speech and ai for the helped us on that by giving us the fund so we um buy some microphones you know all the stuff needed to do the recordings and we had two actors to do the recording one one male and one female and Yes, and things has, you know, we had some problem about the declaration because sometimes you have one actor who begin to do the recording and after 1000 of recordings, you, he just left, you know. And unfortunately in text to speech, uh, you need to have the same actor. I mean, most of the time, at least, you need to have the same actor doing all the recordings. So we had to do that uh, again, I think yes, two times. And after that, we had invited the actors to come in BAM2 to do the collection and it took some, some time, but yes, at the end we have the data set and we are trying also to work also with AI4D to build uh, the first, uh, you know, to build a platform that will be used to showcase text to speech in local, in African languages. And we will begin by one off by using the text to speech data set we already collected and, you know, build the model and, the platform to to help others maybe to add their languages on the platform and it's also with masahan i'm on mute um and how i mean how trans uh, translatable is maybe the <laughs> it's a bit of a bad choice of words but how useful are the the lessons that you learn from from one speech to text in one case, uh, how useful are they for other cases of speech to text translation? Uh, actually, for now, we have not yet built another speech to text models for other domains because we are we want to build the general one. You know, it's it's kind of difficult and it takes a lot of time, but in the long run, it's easier because you don't need to build for every domain. You know, build a dataset and so on. So that's what we are planning to do. Uh, but for now, we are mainly focused on the translation data collection. But I think, yes, I mean, we will try to begin the speech recognition part. But I think it will, you know, speech recognition is kind of most, more difficult because you have to handle a lot of words, you know, a lot of vocabularies. It's not the same as text to speech, where you can just handle the phonemes and so on. So you need to have way more data. And so, you know, close them and it's easy. You just have some words, some sentences, and you just create some derivative and you're good to go. But in a general uh, context, you need to have a lot of data set in first the text data, which will cover many, many words. And after that, you will do the recordings, which will have to be very diverse, you know, having accent, you know, genre and all those stuff. So, I, for now, we didn't yet really do any transfer of knowledge about what we already did, at least in the data collection part, because it will be the same normally, we just more, more work, but we may have to change the way we did 
the thing back then back then it was it was some messy you know it was it wasn't very clean you know we have to do very back black, i mean very very black magic to go beyond some stuff like having many many french words in the text so you have many cartouches back and that was difficult to handle thanks um okay so i the next question i had was around the challenges that you're facing right now we've already spoken touched on a few of them um choice would you like to take us away maybe just touch on one of the challenges that you faced in this space at the moment thank you paul so i think yeah as as also athena has hinted uh, on it is the, the challenge is really around uh, the data uh, especially when you're building a full speech recognition model that requires a lot of data and and when we started out we didn't have yeah we didn't have anything and so uh, that's that's the challenge that we haven't solved yet and i know that through the, the work that we are doing on the common voice platform we try to collect as much uh, data as we need to make sure it's diverse in terms of the accents uh, the female and male speakers and, and you know all those the diversity as 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 a sub a big subtopic so i think that the main problem that that we need is yeah is in terms of having a very good and a very you know diverse data set that's what i would say for now and it sounds to me like that will be an ongoing challenge for for maybe maybe decades to come is is collecting enough data exactly yes collecting enough data uh to have a very good uh, model i i guess and and i i believe that we are starting uh, on this journey you know through all the efforts that 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 are going on with the lacuna fund ai4d uh that that's all of us in our different domains that's what we encounter but we are trying to make efforts to to get there uh eventually and through masakani as well that's great um so Tiano, um, any challenges that you'd particularly like to touch on uh, beyond what you've already spoken of? Uh, I think, yes, beyond that, I said, maybe I will talk about, you know, uh, having computer resources to do the training of models because it's a lot of experimentations and you really need uh, a lot of computer uh, uh, power, you know, to build your model, evaluate them and, you know, do a lot of iteration. And if you want to do also, if you want to go quick, you need to run many iterations at the same time, but that means you need to have many computers at the same time. So it's not that easy. You know, you need, you know, you need financial resources to build those models. And, you know, sometimes it wasn't easy, especially in the beginning, but after we have some funds from uh, NVIDIA inception, you know, having some resources in AWS, but now it's not, it's finished. So we have to find other fundings because this is mainly research development stuff. So we are for now having Azure, you know, so we are working on that. But yes, so I think about, except the data set, yes. Uh, the other thing is having the resources to do the training and all those other stuff. And so, so is it safe to say there they aren't enough computing resources resources in Africa right now for the for the needs of of NLP and other machine learning tasks when you talk about resources do you mean physical machines in Africa well yes um I guess uh physical machines and access to enough cloud computing to to do the work that's required I think physical machine is yes actually in Senegal I could say yes there is no really physical machines needed for doing AI there is remorse remorse about having a data center here but it's mm -hmm. never start so we don't know <laughs> if it's the case or not but yes having access to the cloud is difficult because cloud is money so you need money to do to go in the cloud so that's the main problem but for now we are doing it because we are, we are working with cloud providers and they are giving us credits, you know, so for now we are okay. So I wouldn't say we don't have access because we have, maybe others don't have, but for now we are not having problem with having access to GPU. Okay. Thanks. And um, Jade, I know you have a lot of uh, things to say on the topic of challenges faced in, in African NLP. Would you like to highlight one or two things from your side? 
Yeah, so I think the first one, it's a, so what I like to like to do with the challenge is kind of take a step back and analyze what are the, what are, like what is, what is the issue behind it? So we talk about not having enough data. Why is that? Um, and often it stems from just beyond the data. We don't even have the necessarily, you know, keyboards to capture um, the, the, the text that we use. There's the, you know, the digital keyboards don't exist. Um, so how, how, how can we expect people to write in a digital format if they don't even have the necessary tools or the necessary internet access or the necessary anything else to be able to do that? Not only that, do they even have the demand? You know, what is, what is my incentive for you know, writing as a writer to write in a digital format and put this online if no one's going to go looking for it because they don't actually think that there is that online? Um, so I think there's like a quite a big systemic issue in terms of you know the focus that we're we're putting on these languages um, that's beyond just you know uh, immediately data. Um, for instance, South Africa is doing quite well in this space because it's created the government went and created an entire group that's focused on digitizing these languages, um, and you you don't see um, uh, you might see something similar in in East Africa certain parts of it, uh, particularly Tanzania is quite good, it's their, uh, Swahili is their, their primary language. Whereas often if you look at uh, other parts of Africa, the African languages are slowly being removed out of the official languages. Schools are teaching less and less of them. They're actively supporting less. Um, and so it's not unsurprising then that we can't act, we don't actually have data um, because there's very little incentive from government to maintain uh, these languages um, despite their potential impact. Um, and if all it does is kind of widen divides in society where people speak in languages that aren't necessarily the ones that are written in or the ones that are spoken in schools or the ones that are, are provided for in kind of the education space. Um, so that's one of the big challenges is just fixing that focus and creating space for these languages I think is really, really important. It's a huge, if you don't fix that challenge, then I don't think the, the rest of the wheel does not, does not turn. Um, the other side is uh, kind of more on the kind of uh, compute and algorithm side is uh, the, no one's done research in any of these languages. We don't know if any of the techniques that work, that, that exist actually work, um, because most of them are so English centric or so French centric, um, that they've never ever been evaluated on African languages. They've never been evaluated on, on data sets which are so small or scripts that are so different or, or, or constructs, uh, linguistic constructs that are so interesting. Um, so the results that we have and the state of the art that we have, we can't even necessarily use. And more often than not, the state of the art actually isn't necessarily state of the art in these other languages. So we've got kind of got a giant research gap where people have been, you know, publishing that oh, it's doing well, but even the metrics they're using to measure these things aren't even suitable for the languages. Um, so we're completely, we almost, you know, I'd say we're speaking different languages. But even in the research space. Um, that, that nothing is necessarily carrying over. Um, so this assumption that if it works in English, it works in everything else, it simply isn't true. Um, so that's one of the other major challenges. Um. So, um, and I, I'll ask this to any of you, any of you can respond. If, if there are all these challenges, uh, is it worthwhile doing all this work? What's, what's, what makes it worthwhile? I don't, that's for anybody to answer. <laughs> I think I first go on because uh, there is all worthwhile of doing it because, as I said, uh, many of our fellow citizens here, they are having very difficult time of, you know, on using computers, mobile application, and all those stuff because they don't have, they don't know how to read or speak in French or English. Imagine having all the people in Europe or e in America having only applications that are written in Wolof, that would be a big problem. So they, they, will have, they will have to do the same thing we are trying to do. So we have to do this for, especially for our population to be able to use new technologies and be able to be free kind of using all these technologies. And behind that also, we have to be able to, be, to interact with others who don't speak our languages. And, as I said, if we have many who can read or speak their languages, so we need to have that barrier, you know, we need to remove it and have them to speak with others. So it's difficult, especially we are in the beginning, I think, so it's normal. They, this was the same for the European or the American. So if you see their thing, you know, they had to have many universities working on collecting data and all because they, they know that they need it. So we have to do the same. Uh, it will be difficult, but I think seeing how it's going, it's it's very worth of doing it. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I also think it's it's worth it. Uh, so just to give an example, so uh, I think before we started, Macquarie University has also an institute of uh, languages, you know, who are doing their research, you know, in, in Ugandan languages. But surprisingly, we, we kind of hadn't had this interaction with them right before now. Uh, but now uh, through the efforts on writing uh, maybe the lacuna proposals together or even doing this work because we are not the language experts. And, and so we needed to bring language experts on board. And, and I think that speaks to the point that Jade mentions of, uh, and, and also the thing that Masakani mentions as well around this participatory approach to building and working together. And so through that, that has enabled us to um, have this open doubt. Uh, such that uh, you know people can know about about the work, can know about the importance of building up these language resources, right? For these languages, because if if you keep working in your own space as computer scientists or NLP researchers, then you can't get help. But we need to kind of also spread this out, and and so I believe that we have the challenges, but we kind of can also provide the solutions for these challenges, and and these are the things that we are trying to work on together as a community to to, to bridge that gap, uh, provide a participatory way in which we can even solve uh, this problem of just the data set problem that we have currently that people can get to know and be aware of the importance of digitalizing these resources because they're very uh, important and necessary so the thing about language is that language encodes culture it encodes literature it encodes art it encodes a way of thinking uh, so uh, Sophie Ola Olewale, who's a Nigerian uh, philosopher who specifically wrote in Yoruba, she says there are particular parts of uh, her writings that could not happen in English because she only had the, 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 the means and the, the, the structures in Yoruba to be able to, to, um, uh, speak of, to, to be able to speak of that and be able to capture that. Um, and I think it's similarly, if you look at the languages or Southern African languages, Isizulu, um, there's a pivot on the way, you know, it's not hello, it's sawabono, which is I see you. That's an acknowledgement of a human being. It's like a, a philosophical switch of what that means. And as a, as a result, I think why it's worth it is because we're capturing so much of African society and African identity by ensuring the preservation of these languages. Um, and these can be used in so many spheres. Um, so practically, we can think it could be used in education, it could be used in health, it could be used in business and trade. Um, it can be used in language preservation. So if people want to learn their, um, their uh, home language, which they never had the opportunity to, we could use both tools to do that. Um, but I think that this all fits under like a, a, re a reclamation of African identity um, that, uh, uh, you know, was, you know the, the removal of language was used as a tool against um, the African people time and time again because uh, due to colonization. And I believe that, you know, by putting in all this effort, we are reclaiming that and ensuring its preservation and spurring on uh, ongoing thought and ongoing literature and ongoing art um, uh, in an African context. That's why it's worth it. So um, very inspiring answers all around. <laughs> um, okay, so we're coming just to the end of things. I want to quickly ask you all about um, what you see the sector looking like in the next couple of years, major changes that you're expecting in the near future. I'm not talking about 10 or 15 years from now, but just in the next few years. Um, we can start with you, Joyce. Thanks, Paul. So I think what I see is that uh, based on all the efforts that we're doing together, both you know in Uganda, but also through, I think, the African space, that's Masakani as well, that we are able to, uh, first of all, have a very strong community uh, of NLP researchers, because just taking the example of the named entity work, which is a strong thing on, uh, on the Masakani space. Luganda is there. I haven't met the people, but we all contribute together in that named entity space, right, to create the resources, build the models. So I see a very strong uh, NLP community. Uh, that's working together to build resources and models. But the important thing that these are being built by ourselves from Africa. They are coming uh, from the ground up, moving upwards. So it's not that we are waiting, but we are building the things ourselves as African researchers. So uh, that's where I see this and also some sort of awareness that people get to know all that we are actually doing this work. And so I think for me, that's very important. And I see that uh, in the next maybe three or five years moving forward. Thanks, Jade. So I see um, these, these, some of these nitty gritty problems being solved. So the, you know, 
let's build spell checkers. Let's make sure the keyboards are out. So I know this is something that's coming largely into focus in Masakane is we've got people who, who don't have, you know, their keyboards able to access that. They're, they're starting to work on that. I know even Google's got a giant initiative to push that forward. And what that looks like is that if we have all these spell checkers, these thesauruses, these online tools, as a result, we're going to see a flurry of um, kind of digital media in African languages. And I think if we can open up that tap, then that kind of uh, uh, results in everything else. So this is um, what I see happening. I also see the official, the cost of translation dropping um, because translators now have tools to, to aid them in their translation. Um, and I think that will additionally spur more resources and kind of specifically the translation space. Um, but I think more generally the ability to have tools to access um, the digital space in those languages kind of opens up the taps. Um, so that's what I'd want to see is this suddenly we've got all this data that we now can work with um, to make the, the models even better. Great. And Tiana? Uh, I think what I would like to see in the near future is having uh, our local languages, at least most of them or uh, the most spoken one to be uh, used in uh, applications and you know popular websites like uh, Facebook or Twitter you know being able to translate text from English or French so that people can use it and they are already starting to do this so it's a very new feature or if it's not present so <laughs> uh, but it's kind of for now it's not that accurate and also having us you know our companies for example especially telco companies because everyone used a phone so having those telco companies to use uh, local languages to for their available services so that people anyone can uh, use them uh, whether they can read or speak doesn't matter anymore I think those are really the thing I want to see and I think that it's not really that far because they are interested in it so we just have to build them and you know make them make them use it so and I am sure that they will accept to use it so yes Brilliant. Uh, sounds like an exciting few years coming up, which is really nice to hear. Um, I'm going to I'm gonna wrap up now. We're coming close to the end of our time. So I'd like to say thank you to all of you for your contributions. This has been a really informative, but also very inspirational conversation for me to have. Um, I want to give a little plug here for Zindi. We've got five NLP challenges running currently on the Zindi platform. Um, from and th that's in in partnership with AI4D. Um, so if you uh, anybody listening is interested in trying to get involved, the, that's one way that you can get involved. Um, you can sign up to Zindi and and see try your hand at some of those challenges. I'm sure that uh, Masakane is also open and looking for volunteers. So that's another way that you could get involved. Um, so all that remains for me now is to say thank you to Tiano, Jade and Joyce for your time and your expertise and your inspiring words. Um, and to say that we'll be available in the chat after this panel to answer any questions. I'll also try to collect any relevant links and um, the email addresses of our panelists. I hope you'll happily share those so that people can get in touch. So thank you very much. And goodbye. Thanks, Paul.